Hello there, everybody. I am John Allen, the founder and editor of Crux. This is Last Week in the Church, the show brought to you by Crux, where we are faithfully and relentlessly devoted to warming over stale news about the Vatican and the Catholic Church. You already know because, well, it's already happened, been reported widely, discussed, analyzed, and basically put a fork in it. It's done, except here. This week on the menu, we've got On the Road Again. Pope Francis announces that he will be visiting Cyprus and Greece the first weekend of December. Return of the Road Warrior. The Pope also says that for 2022, he's got two trips on his mind. He'd like to go to the Democratic Republic of Congo in Africa and a return visit to Hungary in Central Europe. POTUS and the Pope. Drumroll, please. U.S. President Joe Biden comes calling on Pope Francis here at the Vatican on Friday morning. And on the subject of important encounters, Pope Francis may also be meeting this week with Prime Minister Narendra Modi of India, a uh, rumored but unconfirmed visit that would nevertheless have high stakes if it happens. And finally, the smiling saint. The Vatican announces that the path has been cleared for the beatification of the late Pope John Paul I, the smiling Pope of 33 days. That's what we've got for you on this week's menu, so please stick around. All right, welcome back. Happy Monday to you. Happy Monday, October 25th in the year of our Lord, 2021. We're going to begin in a slightly unusual fashion today with a visit to our cultural corner here at Last Week in the Church, I'm going to deliver for you a brief recitation. Give me just a second to get into character. And here we go. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we, we happy few, we band of brothers. I delivered that little recitation from the famed St. Crispin's Day speech from Shakespeare's Henry V, because today, of course, is the feast of St. Crispin. Crispin and Crispianus were twin brothers martyred in the third century, but they are, of course, best known today as the occasion for Shakespeare's commemoration of the British victory in Agincourt in 1415. I, at least, am sending up prayers of thanks today because I consider that speech one of the greatest pieces of literary genius ever penned. Actually, don't tell my wife, but sometimes late at night after she's already gone to bed, I will go into our living room, fire up our TV, get YouTube open, and watch the Kenneth Branagh version of that speech. I must have done it 200 times. I bawl my eyes out every time. So thank you, Crispin Crispianus. Thank you, William Shakespeare. All right, to get to our rundown for this week, we begin with Pope Francis in a recent interview with an Argentine journalist. And that is how we get a lot of Pope news, by the way, in the Pope Francis era, interviews with Argentine journalists. In this one, Pope Francis announced that he is going to be hitting the road in early December to visit the conflict-torn island of Cyprus, which of course is divided more or less down the middle between a Greek-controlled portion of the island and a Turkish-controlled portion of the island. And he will also be visiting Greece, presumably to once again stop in at Lesbos, the island off the coast of Greece that is one of the epicenters of the global migrant and refugee crisis. Now, this is a trip with significance for multiple reasons. Let us begin with the fact that the Vatican recently and kind of indirectly more or less told us that Pope Francis was not going to Glasgow in November for the COP26 summit on climate change. He had been widely expected to do so and, in fact, in a news conference had told reporters that he was going, that his speeches were ready, and that the only reason he wouldn't go would be if he, it would be is if he's not feeling well at the time. There was concern, therefore, when the Vatican announced that Italian Cardinal Pietro Parolin, the Pope's top deputy, would be leading the delegation to COP26 instead. There was concern that maybe this meant that the Pope's 
health had taken a dip, maybe his recovery from that colon surgery over the summer is going slower than expected or is proving more complicated. However, Francis obviously believes that by the first weekend of December, he will be feeling well enough to take a trip that is in, in most ways actually more complicated than the very brief stop in Glasgow that he was expected to make. It's a trip with significance on multiple levels. Cyprus, aside from the fact that it's another opportunity for Francis to be the peace pope trying to help resolve one of the world's longest running conflicts, it also has ecumenical significance because the Christian population in Cyprus is overwhelmingly Orthodox. So it allows Pope Francis to try to advance the Orthodox Catholic relationship. It also has interfaith significance because the divide between Turks and Greeks is also a divide between Muslims and Christians. It's a Cold War that is forever threatening to turn hot again. So on multiple fronts, it allows Pope Francis to try to advance core aspects of his social and political agenda. The same, of course, could be said for the trip to Greece and the stop at Lesbos. Pope Francis visited Lesbos in 2016. He will now be doing so again. It's another opportunity for him to shine a spotlight on the plight of migrants and refugees in the Mediterranean region. Remember that he recent promise, recently promised he will never stop being a pest on behalf of people such as these. And this is another opportunity for him to make good on his word. Uh, all right, speaking of the Pope as road warrior, Pope Francis, as I noted, also said in that interview that he wants to visit the DRC, Congo, uh, in 2022, and he wants to go to Hungary. Both of these two are high stakes, potentially at least, trips uh, with great significance. Hungary, of course, Pope Francis was just there, right, in early September. It was the start of a trip that later took him to Slovakia. Or was it Slovenia? Honestly, I get those SL countries confused. But uh, in any event, he was briefly for a few hours in Hungary. But it was not an official state visit. It was simply to preside over a mass opening a Eucharistic Congress. This gives him the opportunity to make a more formal trip, presumably two or three days. Now, from a media point of view, it will be spun up as a kind of clash of the titans because it is Pope Francis presumably standing toe-to-toe -to -toe on multiple occasions with Prime Minister Viktor Orban of Hungary, who is increasingly the leader of the kind of right-wing, nationalist, populist, anti-immigrant current in European politics that is deeply opposed by Pope Francis and his Vatican team. Pope Francis is notoriously a champion of a policy of welcome and compassion for migrants and refugees. He's a strong advocate of European immigration. He doesn't like closed borders or the building of walls. And so uh, we will probably be covering this as a kind of cage match over several days between these two points of reference on the European and global scene. Beyond that, of course, Hungary is one of the most ferociously traditionally Catholic countries in Europe. It's a chance for the Pope to deliver a shot in the arm to the Catholic community there. It's also home to a number of migrant communities and uh, minority communities, including a large population of Roma, colloquially known as gypsies. And it will be, therefore, an opportunity for Pope Francis to get in some, some pastoral work with those communities, trying to assure them of his proximity and acting as an advocate for their dignity and their rights. But in my view, even bigger on the scale of potential significance would be a papal trip to Congo. And here's why. Let's start with simple demographics. By the middle of this century, given population trends, the Democratic Republic of Congo is destined to be either the third or fourth largest Catholic country in the world. Brazil will still be number one, Mexico will still be number two, but Congo and the Philippines will be duking it out for the third spot, which will relegate the United States to fifth place on that list. The Congo is also going to be by far the largest French-speaking Catholic nation in the world. It will have double 
the number of Roman Catholics of France itself. And so by multiple measures, Congo is destined to be a Catholic powerhouse of our times. And already, missionary priests and nuns from Congo are serving all around the world, particularly in French-speaking regions of the world, but there are also plenty in the United States and for that matter here in Italy. And so just in Catholic terms, Congo is a big deal. But Congo is also a big deal in geopolitical, strategic, and economic terms, famously. Congo is probably the, the, the number one country in the world in terms of potential wealth in natural resources. It is home to an estimated 60% of the world's deposits of cobalt, for instance, which is a mineral in use for cell phone batteries and computers, basically every high-tech gadget in the 21st century you can think of depends upon the, the mining and the production of cobalt. It is home to other minerals. It is home to a significant share of the world's diamonds and gold. It's lumber. It, it on and on and on. And, and yet, because of decades, of, well, really centuries, of the legacy of an especially harsh chapter in European colonialism with the Belgian occupation of Congo, and then followed by civil war, political chaos and gridlock, economic mismanagement, corruption on a massive scale, and the lawlessness. I mean, in the eastern Congo alone, the regions around north and south Kivu, there are an estimated 116 separate armed groups that operate with basic impunity. The, the, the ability of the state there to enforce any kind of order is entirely nominal. And, you know, you add to that the, the toll of natural disasters and climate change. Congo is a laboratory for a, a country with vast potential that never seems to meet that potential. Now, Pope Francis will be there trying to deliver a message of hope and encouragement. If Pope Francis can galvanize a kind of Catholic moment in Congo that could lead that country out of its present morass and into taking the place on the regional and global stage that is rightly its own, Congo could become one of the emerging superpowers of the 21st century, and the Catholic Church could be one of the architects of that transformation. It is actually hard for me to imagine a trip that a pope could take in our time with greater potential significance in terms of how the geopolitical chessboard may play out for the rest of this century. So stay tuned. This one could be a humdinger. All right, POTUS and the Pope. This Friday morning, President Joe Biden will be meeting Pope Francis at the Vatican. Biden is in Europe for a G20 summit. He also, of course, is looking ahead to the COP26 summit on climate change next month uh, in Glasgow. And while he is making the rounds, he will be meeting Pope Francis. It will be the first meeting between Biden and Francis since Biden's election as president of the United States but it will be the fourth time the two men have actually met one another. Biden met the Pope a couple of times as vice president under President Obama, and also after he had left office, he attended a conference here in the Vatican where he talked about his moonshot cancer initiative. By all accounts, there is a warm personal chemistry between President Biden, between Biden and Pope Francis. No reason not to expect that this will be a warm encounter between the two men, that both sides, that is the White House and the Vatican, will be at, pain, at pains to paint in positive hues. That said, there is clear subtext to the meeting. President Biden comes at a time when he is under fire from significant segments of his own church in the United States for his positions on abortion rights, gay marriage, other life issues at a time shortly before the U.S. bishops are going to meet and they are expected to vote on a document which, among other things, may contain language 
about denying communion to Biden and other pro-choice Catholic politicians. So, while both sides in this encounter have a strong incentive to present it in the happiest, warm and fuzzy fashion possible, there is no denying that there will be a bit of friction, if not in the apostolic palace when Pope Francis and Biden sit down to have their chat, but outside it in the way this encounter is going to well be thrown into the spin cycle of American politics and commentary. Ironically, that much ballyhooed, much anticipated tete-a-tete between Biden and Francis may not even be the most important meeting Pope Francis has this week. Because there are reports in the Indian press, uh, yet unconfirmed, but also not denied by anyone, that Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who was also in Europe these days for various meetings and summits, that Modi will be dropping in on Pope Francis. Now, should that happen, it's not going to get nearly the media buzz of the Biden-Pope encounter, but substantively, there may actually be much more on the line. Because bear in mind, Prime Minister Modi, a deeply controversial figure, is the leader of the hardline militant nationalist Hindu wing in Indian politics, a, a faction or a force in Indian politics, which has the reputation for making life terribly difficult for India's religious minorities, including its numerically small but symbolically significant Christian minority. There are roughly 25 to 30 million Catholics in India. There are roughly the same number of Protestants. That's a drop in the bucket because India's overall population is almost 1.4 billion, of course, about 85% Hindu. But nevertheless, there also are Sikhs, Jains, Muslims, other minorities in the country. And as this saffron wave of militant Hindu nationalism has rolled through its politics in the last several decades, both de jure and de facto, life has become increasingly difficult for those minorities. You know, the irony of this meeting is that Modi, who will probably win points internationally for seeing Pope Francis, but may draw fire from his own conservative base. Meanwhile, Pope Francis will no doubt win points internationally for the interfaith and geopolitical outreach signified by this meeting. But he too may draw fire from his own conservative base that wonders why he is cozying up to a thug who is brutalizing the Pope's own flock in India. So lot writing on that encounter will be very interesting to see if it happens, and if so, what the choreography and the substance of the exchange is like. And finally, a happy note. Earlier this month, the Vatican confirmed that a miracle has been approved and attributed to the intercession of the late Albino Luciani, better known to the world as Pope John Paul I, the smiling pope of 33 days, that miracle, therefore, means Papa Luciani can be beatified. No date has been set for the beatification, but it is expected to take place sometime in 2022. After that, only one more miracle has to be approved in order for John Paul I to be canonized. Now, this is mostly a feel-good story for the Catholic Church. It is impossible to remember now, but if you were around, in 1978, and I was. I was 13 years old, and I wasn't a Vaticanista back then. I wasn't paying much attention, honestly, to church affairs. I was an altar boy. My horizons didn't go much further than St. Joseph's Parish in Hayes, Kansas. But I remember distinctly those images of the new pope being elected, just beaming. He had this smile, you know, that, that just melted hearts and, and set the world on fire. And, and it was enormously important for the Catholic Church after the doldrum of the late Paul VI years. There was this perceived like gloom and doom hanging around the Catholic Church. And all it took was a few shots 
of that pope with the killer smile. And you just felt, you know, like spring had come. And all of a sudden, good things could happen again. Unfortunately, it was a very brief, lived springtime. He died, John Paul I, after just 33 days. But Pope Francis has been very devoted to the memory of Pope John Paul I, often quotes him in his audiences and other public events. And now he is going to be beatified. Inevitably, though, the beatification is not completely without controversy. There are some theologians and other experts on sainthood who believe the whole business of beatifying and canonizing popes is just, well, dubious. Because either you beatify and canonize them all, in which case it's basically just a perk of office, right? It's another binny. It's like your pension program. Or you pick and choose, and inevitably that looks political. Like, you know, there are some more conservative Catholics right now who are wondering, why are we going full steam ahead on John Paul I, but we're not doing anything on Pius XII, simply because it's not really politically correct, given the controversy that continues to linger about Pius XII and his role in the Second World War on the Holocaust. So, and the thing of it is, the reason to beatify and canonize saints and here's the thing, the reason to beatify and canonize saints is not actually to win them a place in heaven. Catholic theology is that if you're a saint, you're already in heaven, you don't need a papal declaration. It's to lift somebody up as a role model of holiness, somebody who can inspire others. Well, the thing of it is, electing somebody pope already does a pretty good job of lifting them up, right? And so the, the argument here would be it's unnecessary and it's political it invites controversy, why do it? I understand that debate. Personally, if I got a vote, which I don't, I would probably vote for a moratorium on beatifying and canonizing popes, at least until we sort all this out. But the truth of it is, if you're going to do it anyway, John Paul I is such a beguiling and inspiring figure. The shot of his face is a synthesis of all that is pastoral and human and caring and just good about the Catholic Church. So if you're, if you're going to pick one, I would say you could do worse. All right, that is our show for this week. Thank you for being with us. If you are so inclined during the coming week, please go on the social media platform of your choice. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a retweet. Give us a like. Write a nice review. Spread the gospel and make, make disciples of all the nations for your, this last week in the church. There are the next seven days. I want you to stay safe. Stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week. Keep reading Crux, cruxnow.com. That is cruxnow.com, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. We will be here next Monday. See you again soon.